Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Be The Right Club Today podcast. As always, super excited about our next guest, Dr. Bob Winters. Dr. Bob is an internationally renowned sports psychologist, author, and professional speaker. He spent over 35 years helping athletes get in the winner's circle and to achieve their full potential. Some of his, uh, some of his clients include the, the awesome David Ledbetter Golf Academy. Dr. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's great to be on with you, Chase and Hal. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been really uh, listening to, you know, previous episodes, love the show, and I'm just uh, grateful to be, you know, on, on as a guest. Well, we're glad to have you, Dr. Winters. Tell us, uh, I know you kind of the doctor of confidence, basically. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, confidence to me was coming and going all the time, so... Tell us what you think about confidence. I know everybody out there would like to, to have a great deal of that all the time. Well, Hal, that's a great you know opening start. I am known internationally as the confidence doctor. I've spent almost 45, 50 years really looking at confidence. That, but you also have to look at the other side, you know, and that's doubt and anxiety and fear. But you know, when we say confidence to most people, most people think, well, yeah, I believe in myself. You know, good things are happening. But, you know, we really take a, a very long scientific and empirical look at confidence. It's much more than this global belief that says, yeah, I, I think I've got it. I can do something. You're taking a look at a lot of different ingredients. You're looking at grit. You're looking at persistence. You're looking at competence. And, and to me, I have a, a very uh, new, new book, you know, it's going to be coming out here soon. And it's called The Confidence Course. And how I define confidence is that it's a multidimensional phenomenon that encompasses a, a multitude of positive experiences. And it's based you know, on one's understanding that they can do something. They can do something productive. It's highly associated with faith and belief in one's developed and innate you know, abilities. But it's also the ability to resist how and chase the negative influences of doubt and fear. So when a person is confident, they can actually work through that doubt, work through that fear. And it's like a boxer. A boxer has a left jab. I believe I can do this. I can believe I can do this. But that right cross and the knockout punch is this wonderful feeling of, you know, I'm unstoppable. I'm fearless. You know, I, I can't mess up. And that's why people love the feeling of confidence, because when they feel confident, they say, okay, let's go. I can do this. And that's why everybody is after this elusive thing that we call golf confidence. So doc, especially perfect segue, because when you mentioned golf confidence, you're talking about with golf, you're talking about a sport where if we, if you win 10% of the time, you're in the upper echelon of a, of a hall of fame career. Um, how do you, you know, we talk about, and Hal talks about this a lot, ebb and flowing through perfection, say with golf swing. So like, I've kind of I've kind of morphed that to okay we're gonna we've got an ebb and flow with golf swing and we also have an ebb and flow with our psychology with our confidence. Um, how do you get take a Cameron Smith who hit a bad shot at twelve at Augusta or a Jordan Spieth that hit a hit a bad shot at twelve at Augusta a few years ago that really kind of messed him up a little bit? How do you get your players? How do you how do you try to teach golfers to get their confidence back when they've had a bad run of golf? See, that's the whole you know, key right there, Chase. You, know, you asked a, a wonderful question. You know, everybody's talking, how do I get it back? How, how do I get my confidence back? Well, does your confidence ever go? And most of the time, we give our power, we give our confidence away. So you take a look at Cameron, you take a look at Jordan, you take a look at Rory coming down, you know, amen corner all those many years. You know, somehow one shot got away from them. They escalated that into two, three shots. So there's going to be emotional fallout after that. What we have to do, it isn't that we have to get back, but we have to keep moving forward into the next shot with renewed vigor and enthusiasm. And along the way, we need to park that emotional psychological fallout that just happened because that's the power of a focused mind. That's the power of one. And it's a lot easier. And I'm going to be you know, very simple in saying this. It's a lot easier 
for me to sit here and say, hey, this is what you've got to do. A lot easier to talk about, you know, than it is to walk it, you know, to be able to talk the talk and walk the walk. But you've got to be able to force yourself and train yourself. This is how we do it. We play one shot at a time. And what I'm trying to do with my players is help them understand that, you know, it's about beating the golf course because many times people win major championships and they're not playing their very best swing game or physical game, but they have a very astute high level mental game. And I think I heard, you know, on a podcast, you know, a few episodes ago, uh, how you were talking about, you know, Tiger Woods, everybody was really upset with him because, well, I had my C game today and he was still beating the field by four or five shots. Well, the point of it is, I, if you think about some of the major champions, you know, David Duvall and Justin Leonard, they talk about winning, you know, their British Opens. They talk about, I didn't even have my best stuff that day. I guess I was just, you know, in my own little bubble, taking care of what I could take care of. And voila, I'm, I'm here in the winner's circle. But that's the point. You know, what I'm trying to do is identify these golfing cliches. And the cliches are to be in the moment, play one shot at a time, you know, just, you know, just relax and play your game. But most people don't understand that the cliches are the golden keys to great golf. And especially with my junior and my developing tour players, that's, you know, that's we really focus a lot on that. So, uh, Dr. Winters, tell me, what you think the difference between confidence and self-belief is? Well, self-belief, you know, is rooted in one's, you know, self-image and self-concept. I mean, it's a long-term thing. Confidence, you know, does, you know, wane and wax. It does. But if a person is truly confident, has enduring confidence, they have a foundation of self-belief. They have a foundation of grit. And if we really take a look at this thing I call grit, because some of the best competitors I've ever worked with are gritty competitors. They have great attitudes. That is, they have a passion and they have a perseverance to go after this long-term dream. And that grit is consistent with their self-belief. Now, when a person says that they're high in confidence, all right, they really believe they can do something. But you have to have the requisite skills you know, to be confident. You just can't be confident without competence. That's both physical competence and psychological competence. It doesn't do you any good to go out and say, hey, I'm going to go out and win this championship when you don't have the physical and the mental and emotional skills to win that tournament. But if you have the competence, you've had the training and you've had the preparation, you have put in what I call sweat equity. You have earned the right to feel confident. And a lot of people say, well, you know, should I just think that I'm confident? I said, no, here's what you have to do. You have to have an action plan that says, this is what I do to create success here in this moment. And then we do that little success one after one after one until how is done. And then at the end you know, of that day of doing all those you know, little success momentum builders, we have a pool of reservoir that we call sustained confidence. And that's really, you know, you have to have a modicum of of success in order to become confident. You just can't become confident by saying, oh, I'm gonna become confident today. You have to have competence, you have to have grit, you have to have persistence, and that really builds confidence. So, so Doc, you've used the, uh, the term grit a few times now. Um, how, do we, right. how do we develop, how do we teach grit? You know, it's a great, great term. And uh, it was really first brought you know, to light by university pen researcher, Angela Duckworth. And really what she was going in, she was saying, why is it that some people have great talent, all right, but they still you know, come short in performance? And why is it that people who are not that talented, you know, they excel you know, in the limelight, under the spotlight? And she was, you know, found out that you know, one of these uh, characteristics was grit. And I just like, you know, the gritty nature. If you think about the gritty nature of people over the, the past 20, 30, 40 years in golf, I mean, one, one person just comes to mind, and, and that's Corey Pavin. Another one comes to mind is Bernhard Langer. I mean, these guys are tenacious. They're tough. They keep coming at you, and, uh, and there's no let up. So they're like little tanks that just keep coming at you one after one after one, and they just never give up. So when we talk about developing grit, we're talking about developing psychological hardiness, which is a fancy term for just being able to hang in there and get the job done. 
And one of the things I'm always telling my players, I said, you know, hey, golf's a tough game, you know, and I've, I've been around the game a long time. I've played it, played it professionally. And now I've been, you know, with the Ledbetter Academy for 23 years, seeing all sorts of the best in the world and some of the worst in the world <laughs> and the most emotionally challenged people in the world. And, and I'm always telling them, you know, some days you got to live with, you know, making a crap sandwich for yourself. I mean, that's really what it is. And, and you've got to make the best crap sandwich for yourself that you can, because you're going to have to eat it at the end. So we have something called unintentional or unintended consequences. You know, you know, we have to live, you know, with our bad shots. We have to live with our bad results. But if we can make the best of what, you know, we've actually put together, then you will have a pretty daggone good day. And at the end of the day, people go, man, I didn't realize, you know, you scored that well. You, you were really hanging in there. And to me, that's really what grit is. It's just making the very best of what you've got, you know, on that day. Because, you know, everybody talks about giving your best. But, you know, that's you know, something we go into detail with, with my players, you know, at, at length. I always felt like confidence was fleeting. It was here today and gone tomorrow and, and based on a shot sometimes. And uh, but self-belief was something that I always believed the best players at the core of them always had. They always believed that they'd figure out a way to do it. And, uh, you know, at some, when you were talking about grit right there, I almost wanted to say, well, that could be self-belief right there because it's what do I have to do to make this happen? And, uh, you know, I was always amazed. You know, I, I saw a lot of false confidence when I was out there. Oh, and absolutely. I saw people that were trying to kid themselves, which you talked about, you know, I mean, one of my very best friends, I love him to death, Chip Beck, went through one of the hardest times there ever <laughs> was. And I never saw a person that was more confident that it was fixing to be over with. And, you know, I'd see him in the parking lot after he shot a terrible score for him. And I'd say, how you doing, Chip? I mean, I'm saying it out of sympathy almost. How are you? Because you're my friend. And he said, oh, I'm great. It's fixing to get better. I know it's coming right around. And I'm thinking to myself, I'd be breaking every one of those clubs <laughs> right now. But, you know, that was a false confidence, in my opinion. And he had a great attitude through it. But, you know, the sky was falling, in other words. Yeah, well, you know, I, I look at, you know, confidence this way. Is that, you know, confidence is really performance-based. And when people say, yeah, I'm confident, I'm really confident, I think you're exactly right. A lot of people have what we call bogus confidence, false confidence. But I think, you know, for most golfers, they have this thing I call conditional confidence. On the condition, I play well today. Okay, I made that first three-footer for birdie or par. Okay, my putting's set. And I get it up and down here, and I've been having, you know, a problem here with my little lob wedge here. I got this up and down in the second, third hole. Okay, I'm all set. I'm good today. So they based, you know, their confidence on maybe one or two very key shots early in the round. And if it goes well, boom, two thumbs up. If it doesn't, boom, it goes down. And that's the whole point. I'm trying to tell people, hey, listen, you're going to miss a shot. But did you step in there? Did you have a clear plan? Were you decisive? And did you commit to that shot? Now, you, we could have, you know, all the very best strategies in the world and have our best intention and still miss the shot. But you cannot, and I've heard people talk about, you know, one shot can get you going, but I've heard other people, the greatest in the world, say, well, one shot can really destroy you too. I agree with them, you know, in, in theory. But in all practicality, you cannot let your tent collapse because you've missed a shot or had a bad hole or had a bad day. And so when I think about Chip Beck, I mean, he's one of the few people who shot 59 on tour. So, you know, what he's thinking about, you know, really gives him the very best chance to be successful, Hal. But, you know, and it's, I'll tell you what, it's really easy sometimes when somebody has this unbelievably optimistic attitude and everybody looks at them and go, I, boy, I just, I don't see it with this guy. But maybe he really thinks that's what he needs to do. So you talk about, you know, perception, or is it self-deception? So his perception is, hey, if I, think, if I think this way and I keep always moving towards you know, improvement, 
you know, I know I will get there. And I mean, that's the whole notion about having long-term goals. This is where I want to go. And this is really how I get there. I remember, you know, Tiger Woods always coming in after the last few years saying, well, we're not there yet, but uh, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. And nobody questioned Tiger, you know, whether he was confident or not. And that is the really the first thing, Hal and Chase, I ask every student I work with. And I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're a grizzled tour veteran or a junior player. First question I ask them in relation to your golf, are you good? Because I am looking for that belief system, Hal. I am looking, do you really believe in your talent? Because that is the number one mental mistake in golf, is that you don't believe in your talent. You don't believe in yourself. Even if you've prepped, even if you've done all the training, even after you've read all the books, seen all the videos, listened to all the podcasts, when you step up into your shot, do you believe good things are going to happen? And it's like a knee-jerk response. You know, when I get, you know, these, these people say, uh, yes, um, but, and they always put the but in there. And we know that when you put the big but in there, it sort of discounts everything else, you know, that's already been previously said. So they will give you some reason why they aren't that, you know, good. So, you know, we actually just go from there. It's just a very soft opening. It sounds almost childlike to ask that. But even when we were little kids, you know, someone would come up to you and if you were good at your sport or whatever, and they say, are you good? I mean, little kids are pretty, you know, blatantly honest. They go, yeah. And they go, how do you know? They go, because I play well. You know, and that's how they do it. I think what happens is we get junior golfers and they get, you know, into those you know, teenage years and the peer group starts to becoming a very influential factor. And I'm talking about developing, you know, their mental games as well. You know, they're looking around and, you know, do they compare and everybody's asking them, you know, who do you think you are? You think you're, you think you're better than this person? You think you can beat this girl? And a lot of times, you know, we sort of learn that fear. We learn that self-doubt. And that's why, you know, we're always talking about playing with this childlike innocence, this childlike confidence. And what happens as we get older, we have to replace the innocence and the naivete with wisdom, experience. And again, I'm going to come back, you know, with patience, with a great attitude and confidence and grit. You know, so those are really key elements, you know, to, to developing one's self-belief and one's confidence. Before we go any further, I want to go back up on Chip. Chip's one of my best friends. He's a great <laughs> guy. I was always pulling for Chip, a great player. And uh, so when I said that, I was only saying that because I was hopeful that he was going to pull out of the slump that he was in. I've experienced a slump. And if you'd have asked me, was I a good player whenever that slump was going on, yeah. I would have readily said, not right now. Because, hmm. see, I had experience of knowing what a good player was, and I also had experience of knowing what a not a good player was. And to me, the innocence is lost by both success and failure, which you call wisdom. Right. And, exactly. you know, that's where we lose the innocence is because we've had our hand in that fire before. <laughs> oh, that's true. And I think, you know, how that's a, a great way for me to pick up on this is that uh, obviously, yes, you know, Chip, Chip Beck knew that you were actually pulling for him. I think everybody did. I, I really do. And what I mean to say is that I think sometimes uh, when we have athletes who've had a lot of success, a lot of great success, and then they kind of go into sort of, you know, that abyss, they, they don't know really where they're at. And they kind of trying to find their way out. You know, I always call it slump busting. And they have this fear. And it's not the fear of failure so much because everybody fails. If you've been successful, you, you have learned how to deal with failure and get through it. But the greatest fear I think that athletes usually have who are great athletes and they aren't really performing up to their standards, to their own self-imposed expectations, it's the fear of inaccessibility meaning they can't access, you know, those talents that they knew that they had. And that's the fear. They're going to say, I wonder when it's going to show up. Will today be the day? You know, will, will I really show up? You know, will the great player that I am really show up? You know, or will you know, it be another day of frustration? And I deal with that, you know, quite a bit. I deal with that, you know, day in, day out. And that's, that's just something that's very individual. And of all the sports, you know, that I've actually, you know, participated in, been a coach of, 
I mean, golf is probably the single fingerprint, you know, of, of all sports. I mean, everyone has their own individual style. And what we're always trying to do is build a personal playing philosophy for every person, because their philosophy is their foundation. It's their concrete foundation that says, this is what I know I can do. This is how I do it. This is my process. And that's really what we're building on. So doc, I want to go back on this kind of competency versus confidence thing that uh -huh. you talked about. You, you mentioned competency and we've had a couple other sports psychs and performance coaches talk about competency yeah. and how, how I kind of like your take on this too. So like with, let's use chip back as an example again. Um, sure. Do you think that, you know, if you were, if you were consulting with chip, you would be trying to keep his confidence level at a 10 out of 10 on a scale. Right. But something in that during that time of his was keeping him from from playing well. Um, when do you decide if it's a competency issue? When do you decide if it's it's not his lack of confidence? He he believes in himself. His self belief is high, and let's say the confidence ebbs and flows a little bit based off some performance. It's hard to be at your utmost confident if you're missing cuts all the time. But let's say he was an opt he was a a naturally optimistic person, and, and his confidence was in a place where you were comfortable with. How do you have the competency talk? Well, I think that's where uh, <laughs> liars figure and figures don't lie, Chase. You know, you have to take a look at the hard data sometimes. And if, you know, Chip Beck or anyone like Chip Beck, you know, who is an optimist, you know, they will say, listen, I, I want to show you some data here. And I want to show you, you know, you are only as strong of a, of a chain as your weakest link. And we've got a weak link here. And so that's the whole point, you know, is that in golf, like in other sports, other activities, we have our strengths and then we have our weak areas, our weak links. So we're always trying to shore up those weak links, okay? And whether it's a competence skill, a motor skill, or whatever it is, even a psychological mental skill. But the point of it is, at the same time, in developing a competency, we don't want to take those great maximum strengths and diminish them. You know, that's, that's something that most people, you know, always forget, you know, because we're always trying to, you know, really work on our weak areas. And I've had a lot of players come in and see me, you know, they've lost their tour card and they say, well, I was great with the short game and I was great with the putter, but I needed another 10, 15 yards. And, and in their quest, you know, to become, you know, a really good player at 10, 15 more yards, they actually failed to actually get the ball in the hole. They, they were short game gurus, you know, on tour. And that's really what made them the money. And they sort of gave up their bread and butter, you know, strokes for trying to, you know, be powerful. So that's what we always, we always go back and look. So I look at, you know, the dad and I would say something like the chip say, okay, here's really what we need to, you know, to focus on. I love that you're doing everything great. I love that you're totally optimistic, but we have to have this optimism based on subjective and objective realism. You know, this is where you're really a little bit deficient on. But if we can get this, if we can get you moving here from point A to point B to point C, moving in a good direction in this competency, then you will actually feel that in your confidence. You'll see the results in your game. Because, you know, there's just no BS in golf. And you guys know that. You know, you just can't, you know, BS the golf ball. Because when you step onto the course, I mean, everything is revealed to you. You know, there's just no hiding it and there's no hiding your weak areas because the more you try to mask it, the more you try to play away from it, it always, you know, surfaces. So we have, we have to sometimes have this discussion and meet it head on. It's not a bad discussion to have, you know, and I think, you know, if you're working with a player, you've got to be really honest with them and they've got to be honest with you. I think that's really where the trusting and working alliance comes from. I mean, it's, it's not the hell I have all the answers. Because I don't, but, you know, let's just sit here and let's talk about it. Let's see if we can work this through. And I think that's being very honest, you know, with my athletes. I used to always say you can lie to everybody else, but you better not lie to yourself. <laughs> well, that's, that's I mean, a great because, thing. Yeah. Like you said, the golf course is fixing to expose the truth. Absolutely. You know, and, and the whole point is, you know, whatever you bring into the golf ball, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, that's reflected into your golf shot. I mean, it just shows up all the time. Now, it may just be a physical execution, a physical breakdown, but action follows thought. So, you know, what you're thinking and what you're really actually doing, uh, you know, it really usually shows up, you know, in a, 
in a golf swing and a golf shot. And that's why we always talk about getting your mind focused in, in this whole notion of what I call getting to a green light before you step into the golf ball. That is absolutely the most key thing uh, in, in what we talk about our routines. You know, everybody talks about, you know, having the same number of looks, the timing, all of these ancillary qualities, auxiliary qualities of a routine. But to me, and I've been looking at routine research now for God, 30, 35 plus years, the most important part of any routine for me is to get that player absolutely positively sure that they know this is what's going to happen when they step into the ball. Because, you know, there's two moments of truth in a shot, Chase and Hal. There's a moment of truth behind the ball when you say, this is what I want to do. I've got this green light. I'm getting to a yes mindset. And then I step across that trust line, that imaginary line that separates thinking from acting. And then I step into the ball and I'm looking at my target. And I'm really not thinking anything other than that ball going to the target. I call this directional silence. Your mind is just quiet. You know, you just have sort of this visual thinking, just looking at the target, you got this feel, and I'm going to swing that feel right to the target. And, and to me, when you hit, you know, the golf ball, that's the second moment of truth, okay? And the golf ball never lies. But if you get, you know, the first, you know, moment of truth right, the second moment of truth usually, you know, comes up pretty good. And then whatever happens, you know, with the shot, you have to accept it because it is what it is. And no amount of belly aching or contemplation or having a pity party is going to bring that shot back. So you only have, you know, one thing to do, and that is to accept it. Doesn't mean you have to have, you know, uh, pussy willows and daisies and laugh it off, you know, because sometimes I hurt a little bit, even when I play and I hit a bad shot, I accept it. I don't have to like it, but I have to accept it because it is just a neutral objective. And so if I can park it and put it behind me, like the Lion King, Hakuna Matata, if I can put it behind me and move forward, that is a hell of a mental skill. Perhaps one of the most important mental skills that, you know, young people and even, you know, older golfers, you know, can learn. Because the sooner you learn to actually put the bad stuff behind you, we can, you know, make it easier to get to the good stuff that's right in front of us. So, so real quick, Doc, let's go back. The, I love the green light stuff. So your goal is to, number one, it's to have an idea of what you're trying, what shot you're trying to hit. That's behind the ball. That's creating a plan. That's what I call it. It's creating a plan. What, what's the plan? And then that's step one. And then once you step through to say in the, in the do box as, as the, the vision 54 ladies talk about, um, then, then what's the goal? And then a follow-up question to that is where do, where do you see most of the players make mistakes in this process? And, and it's actually a three-step process. It's the plan it's doing over the ball and then it's accepting the result. So where do you see the, where do you see them make mistakes? Well, you know, I'll tell you what, let me just give you just a really quick, I'll give you a little information set here. It's a six step one shot mindset. And the first step is creating your plan. And I always love, you know, the basketball coach, John Wooden, that says, when you fail to plan, you're just planning to fail, all right? Because when you create a plan, you're saying, this is what I see. This is what, you know, the shot calls for. I'm making a very clear decision. And decisiveness is your conduit to confidence. The more decisive you are in seeing a shot, feeling a shot, that's the shot I want to hit. Now you're sort of like Nike. This is what I need to do, and I'm just going to do it. Now, the second step, you know, for a lot of people, and a lot of people need to do this from behind the ball, and behind that trust line is they need, they need to rehearse that swing. And this is neural priming. You are presetting that feel. So we are actually rehearsing, and what I call a prehearsal swing, you're prehearsing that swing movement. It isn't just to warm up you know, the motor neurons or just get the body loose. It's to really set a very specific real-time swing so that the body you know, is already pre-stretched. So then the third step is you're going to commit to that plan. So you, you, know, you create your plan, number one. You rehearse that plan, number two. And number three, you're now looking at your shot. You're committing to this shot. And a lot of people, they have imagery, they visualize, they breathe. But when you commit, it's a pledge. It's a promise. This is what I'm going to do to hit this shot, to get this ball from point A to point B. This is my ultimate you know, task right now, task and target. But you're also committing to your club. You're committing to the feel that you just rehearsed. You're committing to sort of the, the trajectory. But most importantly here, you're committing to yes. 
This is what I'm going to do right now. And when you get to that, that is your first moment of truth. And that allows you to take step four, which is to walk across, you know, that line. Now, walking across and stepping into the ball, you've got about six or seven seconds there. And for a lot of players, <laughs> that's when we start to sort of have, you know, the shaky legs. We start, you know, to look around. We start to let our mind wander. That's why I say it's really important to fall in love with your target and get yes to your plan. So then when you step into the ball, you're just aiming and aligning yourself, you know, to the ball and to the target. You're really taking some really good looks. You really, I mean, I came from a sports vision background and I learned the value of the visual system, just locking on to that visual memory to the target and then coming back to the ball and then just swinging to that memory. It's what Tiger Woods talked, you know, about his pop, you know, saying, you know, paint the picture with, you know, the target, paint the picture with the putt. And then you step up in there with this directional silence, looking at your target. Here's what I want to do. Boom. And you create this, what I call almost a, a reflex response. You look at the target, come back to the ball, swing to the target, and then you accept whatever happens. Now that's, that's you know, six very basic steps. You know, and so the point of it is getting to the green light means I have a directive. I have a plan. And I'm always telling my young players, go, I, I just don't have any confidence in this shot. I said, trust this process, trust this plan. And then I always bring up, you know, sort of this analogy. I said, the men and women who go fight in war, they are scared. I mean, they are afraid, but they have a mission. They have a directive. They have a plan of action. And because they've rehearsed it and they dedicate themselves to that plan of action, that allows them to get through that fear, to stay right here, to stay centered and stay on task. Because really the whole difference between performing well and performing mediocre is when you focus on execution, that allows you to get through the doubt, get through the worry, get through the trepidation and really you know, get the job done. And that's really what I'm doing with you know, my players. And that's hopefully that answers you just you know, a little bit. Good stuff. I didn't mean to digress there a little bit. I get no. a little bit long winded, but Great. Uh, I, I feel, I feel really passionate about this because one of the things I've found over these many, many, many years I've been doing this is that the one thing I see people do, they go, well, uh, yeah, here's my routine. And then I'll watch them maybe two or three holes. And they'll say, what do you think of my routine? I go, well, your routine is very consistent. They go, really? And I go, yeah, it's consistently inconsistent. You aren't doing anything as a routine and your mind's, you know, going all over the place. You're, you're taking different looks, different time. You know, are you really there? You know, because most time I see players stepping into the shot and they think they're ready. But then when they get into the shot, they start to have doubt. They start to have trepidation. They feel uncomfortable and they hit what I call the anyway shot. They're, they know they're not ready and they know they're uncomfortable and they sit back and go, well, everybody's watching me and I don't want to take any more time. I'll just get this over with. I'll just go ahead and hit it anyway. <laughs> and the anyway, as you both know, the anyway shot goes anywhere. And then when they hit it, they go, I knew I was going to do that. That was so stupid. And then they have a lot of self beratement, a lot of negative talk. And, you know, the clear thing they should have done is when they actually stepped across that trust line. And they weren't in that green light. They were in that yellow light or a red light. They need to say, stop. In my world, we call it thought stoppage. You say, stop. You back yourself up. You go back and you reset. And you recommit and get to that green light. You know, and that's just such a simple thing. And by people doing that, just that one simple little intervention right there, not hitting a shot until you're absolutely positively FedEx guaranteed the ball is going to go to the target, you know, that will save people a lot of strokes and a lot of heartache. Good stuff. Let's talk about putting for a little bit. Okay. I, I know love you've, that. Uh, you've got uh, on your website, you talk about the 10 rules of putting or. Sure. Why don't you share that with us? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a few tips. And uh, again, I always ask people when I first, you know, meet them, I, are you a good putter? And they say, yeah. And I said, well, do you think you can become a great putter? And they go, 
I'm not really sure, but I'm a kind of a streaky putter. And I'm always trying to say, hey, you know, putting to me, Hal and Chase, it's always been a lot more about your attitude and your philosophy than it has been, you know, stroke and mechanics. Believe me, I think stroke and mechanics are great. And I think, you know, the better your stroke, the better your mechanics, you know, the better putter you'll probably become. But, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this story years ago. Uh, I was playing for the Ball State golf team just a little bit before how you were playing in, in school. And we were a school up in, in the Midwest and we we're in Muncie, Indiana. And Don Padgett Sr. was the head pro at Green Hills, you know, country club. And Don was the secretary treasurer combined uh, office there for the PGA of America. And he had about 26,000 people he's taken care of. And he was our head pro at Delaware Country Club. And we had a first assistant named Paul Bessler. Well, on my team, I had a teammate by the name of Mike Hacker. <laughs> it's a great name for a golfer. And he's a great yeah. friend and was a fraternity brother. And I really, to this day, you know, and all the people I've seen putt, he was absolutely the very best putter I've ever seen. Everything he could do, he would just knock in putts from all over. And he had a philosophy that every putt, you know, he looked at, he could make. And one day we're actually practicing on the putting green. He looks at me and he goes, Bobby, he goes, I, I, I can't make anything. He goes, I'm, yeah, my, my, my confidence, my putting confidence is gone. I can't make anything. Take a look at my stroke. And I took a look at his stroke. And, and I'm going to tell the story. It's a little bit long, but I looked at his stroke and I said, well, do this, do that. And he goes, mm. I said, I'm going to go in and ask, you know, Donnie Padge. That's what I called him, Padge, Mr. Padgett. So I went inside and asked, you know, Paul Besser. I said, is, is Mr. Padgett in? He goes, he's in his office. So I go back to his office and knock on the door. Boom, boom, boom. You know, Mr. Padgett's in there and he's busy. And he's go, who is it? I said, it's Bobby Winters. He goes, what do you want? And I said, I need to talk to you, Padge. He goes, well, come on in. And then he looks at me and he sits back in his chair. He's got like, you know, his reading glasses, puts them down. He's got a whole bunch of yellow legal tablets. We didn't have QuickBooks or TurboTax back then. <laughs> okay, that was back in the 70s. And he looks at me, he goes, what are you talking about? What are you, what are you in here for? And I said, Mike Hacker is out there and he's, you know, we're getting ready, you know, for this next tournament. And he's telling me that he's lost his putting confidence and he hasn't been making any putts. Don Padgett sat back in his chair and he goes, Michael said that? And I go, yeah, and I think it's pretty serious. He wants you to come take a look. And he puts his glasses down. He says, well, I don't have another damn thing better to do this afternoon. <laughs> so he gets up and he walks out with me, you know, to the putting green. And like, you know, all these great teachers, you know, that I love, you know, the Harvey Pettigs and people like that. He comes up, you know, to Michael. And he goes, Michael, your friend, you know, Buddy Winters here said that uh, you're not putting real well. What's going on? And Michael said, well, Mr. Padgett, he goes, I'm, I'm trying all these things back and forth and really trying to get my hands here. And he said, well, tell me again what you're trying to do. And Michael goes, well, he goes, I'm just trying to get, you know, this nice transition from, you know, backstroke to through stroke and really hold my finish and keep the putter head low. And he said, well, roll a couple. And he rolled a couple and they miss left, miss right, what we call dispersion errors. And then Don says, you know what, Michael? He goes, what is it you really want, you know, the ball to do? And Michael says, well, I want the ball to go in the hole. And he goes, well, why don't you just think about doing that? He goes, just rolling the ball into the cup. Into the cup, Michael. So Michael got, and he's got about a 12-footer, 13-footer there. He steps up, boom, rolls it right in the hole. And Padge goes, let's go over here a little bit, you know, maybe about five feet away. Uh, from where we were, it's still about a 15 foot putt. He goes, go through your thing and let me see what you do here. But just think about rolling it into the cup. Michael rolls it into the cup. He did this three or four more times. All of a sudden he asked Michael, he goes, Michael, now isn't that a heck of a lot better way to putt? Just, you know, really thinking it's going to go into the cup and you've got a great stroke and believing in it. And he goes, yeah, it's great. Thank you, Mr. Pageant. And then Don Padgett looks at me and he puts his hands up in the air. He goes, Winters, case solved. And then he walks, walks away. Now I'm sitting there and I've got this inquiring mind. I'm a sophomore at Ball State University. I'm sitting here going, hold on here. I've read all the books. You know, I thought I was pretty astute, you know, teacher. And I said, hang on. What did Don Padgett say that I didn't say? So I go back in and I follow Don Padgett back to his office. He hadn't more than got sat down. I knock on the door. He goes, who is it? I said, Mr. Padgett, it's Bobby Winters. He goes, what do you want now? And I said, I have to ask you a question. 
So he says, come on in. And he's gracious enough to give me another you know, two minutes. And I said, I saw what you gave, you know, Michael. And I said, I told him the same thing. Why did it take with you and not with me? Is it because, you know, you're Don Pageant and I'm, you know, just his teammate? He said, winners, listen to this and savor the flavor, because I'm only going to tell you this one time. He goes, now I know and you know that we didn't give Michael anything that he didn't already have, right? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, but Michael was hurting. And Michael needed to have, you know, something, a little trigger, a little boom, a little bump, if you will, to actually kick up that confidence of his. And I said, yes, sir. I said, kind of like Dumbo with the crow's feather, you know, that made him believe that he could fly. He goes, you're a smart college kid. Exactly. He goes, now, remember, Bob. And he started, you know, pointing, you know, with his hands. He goes, remember. And he starts tapping his temple. He goes, this is pointing to his head is so much more vital in sports, especially golf, than this. And he's talking about, you know, holding the grip. He goes, you follow? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And so I walked out, you know, that, you know, day, knowing that, you know, the power of belief, the power of suggestion was unbelievable. And, you know, what you think you are, you become. I mean, that's the strangest secret in life. You know, what you think about, you truly bring about. And that next day, I went to the student center and changed my major <laughs> to uh, physical education and psychology and business administration. And then the rest has just been, you know, kind of uh, an unbelievable journey along the way. But that story right there, you know, just a person just saying something, just something, a little something to trigger, you know, a, a positive response. Now, is that a placebo effect? Well, a placebo effect, you know, uh, stops being a placebo when there is some treatment, when there's some positive, you know, after effect. So what Don Padgett gave him and what, you know, I had actually tried to suggest to him was this is what you need to be doing. And so the thing I learned from Don Padgett, Hal and Chase, is that where do we want the ball to go? And I always think about the last three words. I want to go into the cup or to the target. So whenever, you know, I'm getting a student, we're actually talking about stepping up into the ball. Where do you want the ball to go? I want to swing through the ball and have the ball go to the target, whatever that target is. So those three words, and we live, you know, in a society of three words, just do it. You know, uh, Coke is it. Uh, I love you. Go to hell. I mean, we've got three words. You know, we've got three word sentences. So those are the things I, I always, you know, just take, you know, from that, you know, that story. But it's just something that we talk about in putting. Now, I, I know I made a long, long story, but when I talk about these 10 mental rules of putting, and I've done, you know, so much research, we've talked, you know, and written a lot of books on putting, is that rule number one is that, you know, all great putters believe that every putt can be made you know, no matter the distance. I mean, that's, that's rule number one. And rule number two is every putt you putt deserves to be made. Now, if you can go into every putt thinking, believing, and acting upon, you know, those two things, the two premises, you've got a really good chance of really being a great putter. Because I remember one time Brad Faxon said something. He said, you can't think about statistics. You can't think realistically if you really want to be a great putter. And that's what I've always talked about putting. It's about possibility putting. You know, is it possible? I'm going to knock this in. And great putters, when they get on a roll, they don't care if it's five feet, 50 feet, 20 feet. They don't care how many they've made in a roll, uh, in a row. They're ready to make putts. So that's where I first start. Great putters, you know, believe they can make any putt. And I always go back to that 2010 exposition uh, or exhibition match between uh, Tom Watson Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer and Johnny Miller, where our Jack, you know, comes down and he makes that 120 foot putt, you know, up at, at Benton Harbor Shores. And Johnny Miller was going to hit a wedge up there because he, he said he, the ball wouldn't stay up there. And Jack said, you want me to putt it for you? And Jack just throws the ball down, goes up there, gives it a whack and the ball goes into the hole. So, I mean, to me, that's, that's obviously when I say every putt could be made, I'm not saying that you need to gun every putt or that you're going to send it, you know, 10 feet by. I'm just saying that you have to go in with that philosophy that, you know, hey, this putt can be made and this putt deserves to be made. And that's a pretty good place, you know, where I start, Hal. 
I love what you said. It's not so much like what, what you said about facts and it's not so much about what the stats say that, you know, your make percentage from 20 feet is 8% or whatever, but you've, you've got to be, you've got to believe, you know, almost, you know, not accurately optimistically to, to be able to, you know, give yourself a chance to be, be great, to be better than average. Right. I think that's a, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, it is. And really what we talk about when we talk about possibility thinking, um, I go back, you know, to this uh, Satchel Page, the great baseball player, African American, who was 43 years old when he signed his first major league baseball contract. Obviously, he had played a lot of other semi, you know, pro ball. But when he was going in spring training, some of the, you know, the younger fellows were going, Page, how old are you, man? And he looked at him. He goes, well, boys, how old would you be? If you didn't know how old you was, <laughs> he goes, age, age is mind over matter. You, if you don't mind, it don't matter. And I started thinking about that. And I'm sitting there going, hmm, about performance. How good would you be if you didn't know how good you was? And that led me to the other question I always ask you, my athletes, how good would you be if you didn't know how good you had to be? And how good would you be if you really let yourself be as good as you possibly could be? unlimited you know thinking i mean just let's let's free it up here because that's the whole point and i think that's what happens so much with golfers is that we have a scorecard and it becomes a prison cell and people start talking about their handicaps and we create this comfort zone of score i mean let's let's throw away that scorecard let's just think about i'm going to play each shot each moment as great as i can and i'm just boom and just be out there and just let's just play you know as well as we can and i remember you know when i first came you know to uh, ledbetter and i mean we he was you know coaching uh justin and ian poulter was there and lee westwood and you know F you know uh, nick price everybody you know ernie else were coming in and i remember asking justin one time i said have you ever in a round of golf really felt like you gave your best willful intent on every shot i mean really at a very high quality level, like the best you could possibly do. And he looked at me and smiled and he goes, no, I never have. I goes, I've tried, but is that even possible? I go, it is. I said, but it's again, it's a mental trained discipline. And I said, how many times have you ever been over a shot and you felt like I want this shot and you turned up that volume of intention, that volume of purposefulness a little bit. And you created that shot. So when people start talking about willpower, will you give yourself the power to actually do this? That's, that's the real power of choice right there. But what I find most people, they don't have willpower. They have won't power. I won't allow myself to believe I have the power to make this happen. So that's the whole point. So when people say, you're the confidence doctor, how are you going to give me more confidence? Just, just give me some confidence. It isn't that I'm going to give them confidence per se, but I'm going to help them remove the doubt, remove the uncertainty and get absolutely self-assured. This is the strategy. This is the plan. This is how we create success. Because when you actually eliminate the doubt, you eliminate the interferences, those distractions of negativity, you now you know, are free to actually play the way you can play. And that moves us towards becoming confident. So real quick, real quick follow-up, Doc, on that point. You mentioned sure. earlier sustained confidence, and then you also mentioned a bunch of little successes. So give our listeners okay. some little things that you, some little drills or some things they could do to build up, build up some little successes and then kind of help them grow more sustained confidence. Well, I think, you know, just one thing. You just have to ask yourself, you know, you know was my mind in the right place? Before I stepped into the ball, did I really have a good plan? Did I really see feel or know that my ball was going to the target because it's not true that all people can visualize well and some people don't see anything some people just say i know my ball needs to go there i just need for them to get that just just getting to sort of that green light knowing before you step into the shot and then you know step into the shot and hit the shot and at the end of a hole at the end of a day they can actually you know just sort of track it up and go was my mind in the right place every time I stepped into the ball? That's a great mental game goal that, you know, every player can do. Another goal is, you know, 
What about, you know, your, your effort, your intention? And when you stepped into the ball, did you give a great effort each time? Because we can, we can control that effort, all right? Because what I find is that, you know, majority of players, I'd say almost 95% of them, sort of kind of go through the motions. And they sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, they almost tank their talent. They don't really give themselves, you know, the very best chance to being successful. So, you know, what we're always trying to do is say, hey, all right, so you didn't execute that well on that shot. Okay, release that, put that behind you, what I call the Lion King. You know, it's a great golf psychology movie. No worries, put the past behind you, move forward. Let's move forward into the next shot. Let's get this next shot. I mean, even Ben Hogan, the great Ben Hogan was talking about, what's the most important shot in golf? It's, it's the next one, but really it's the shot you're looking at right now. And so I've, I've always tell people, you know, that's really what the greatest cliches you know, are. They are the secrets, you know, to great success. When you hear players in the winner circle, they say almost the same thing. You look at all the transcripts from the PGA, European, LPGA tours. What do the winners say? They'll go, you know, it's kind of funny, but <laughs> I know it sounds like a cliche, but I played one shot at a time. I really didn't look at the leaderboard. I let everybody else go and just kind of did my own thing. They all say that. What does that mean? It means that, you know, I play my game, task and target, and I beat the golf course. And if I beat the golf course, I don't have to worry about anybody else. So those are the things right there, you know, that I would tell them to do. You know, get your mind in the right place. And then, you know, when you hit the shot, accept the shot and know that your mind's going to be in the right place for the next shot. But that's just a habit. And they can actually practice that on the range and then take it to the golf course. But you've got to develop that competence of getting your mind in the right place before you take it to the golf course for sure. So I was the whole time you were talking, I was sitting here thinking about, I was reflecting back in my lifetime and uh, you mentioned the will to make the putt. You were, you putting forth the effort to make the putt. And, you know, I had a, it was a six foot, Inside six feet, I expected to make it. In fact, I really thought I was going to make every one. Anything outside six feet, I wasn't sure I was going to make it, which changed. It gave me an out, so to speak. It gave me a, it's okay if I miss it because a lot of people miss those butts. And I was just sitting here thinking if I could have just moved that two feet, over the course of 23 years, how much would that have been? What kind of difference would that have made? And so for all the listeners that are out there, it's small steps that end up making big contributions to the end result. Am I making sense? No, absolutely. And what you're saying there, Hal, is I hear that a lot. People go, you know, if I get anything outside, you know, three feet, uh, you know, okay, you know, I, I feel a little bit more, you know, I, I don't, I don't have to make it. And the point being is, is that I happen to feel that when a person says this putt is for par, or this putt's for birdie, or this is important putt, they start labeling putts. Okay. I don't want to say that you labeled anything out of six foot, you know, you kind of give yourself a little release, but I'm sitting here thinking, hey, what if Hal Sutton stepped into every putt going, you know what? I may not know this is going in, but by golly, I believe it's going to go in. And I think that was, you know, what Nicholas had. I think Nicholas had, you know, that belief that every putt he stepped into, he believed he was going to make that thing. Now, he may, he may have known it. You know, sometimes you just know a putt's going in. It's almost like that deja vu experience. It just, I knew that putt was going in. But if you can get your point yourself to the point that every putt you believe is going in or has a great chance of sniffing the hole, boy, I'll tell you what, now, now you're really become, going to become a great putter because that's the way great putters think. They don't care if it's 20 foot, 30 foot, six foot, seven foot. They don't put a label on it. They're just saying this putt deserves <coughs> to be made. And that's why I say a putt is a putt, is a putt. I mean, whether it's a birdie putt, par putt, it quit thinking about the labels. If it's an eight foot putt, it deserves to be made and it can be made. 
So let's just step into it. Every putt we step into, let's be committed to giving it the best rule, the best, you know, putt line and the best distance control and speed that we can. And let's think about that ball being like Don Padgett said, into the cup. And if you get your mind, you know, that clear every time, you're going to start, you know, putting better. You're starting to start playing better, scoring better. And I think, I remember you said a long time ago, I think golf is a lot of fun. And I, when, I, when I think about scoring low, I don't know. I think I was one of yours. You know, when I, when I go out, when I play my best golf, I was think I'm going to score low today. And that's really what, you know, having this unlimited possibility thinking is all about. Let's go. It's what I call limbo golf. How low will you allow yourself to go? It's no holds barred. Let's go one after one after one until how and chase are done. And that's what we do. <coughs> Uh, that's good. I love the label stuff, whether it's for a, a putt for 65, whether it's a putt to win the masters, whether it's a putt to break 80, where, whether it's a putt for triple, it doesn't matter. It's what's the speed, what's the line. I, I would like to make this putt and I'm capable of making this putt. Let's let it go and hit it. I, I think that's really strong. Absolutely, uh, Chase, because the physical task remains the same. It's when we put sort of this perceptual mountain uh, on this. I mean, we start putting this putt on a pedestal, if you will. Oh, this is a huge putt. This, this really means something to me. And what people don't realize is that pressure, you know, the, the great definition of pressure is that pressure is a factor or any combination of factors that increases the importance of you wanting to perform well. And one something that really increases the importance of performing well is your own perceived value. When you start saying something like, this is a big putt. I have to make this putt. I must make this putt. It's three foot or I should be able to make this putt. You're putting a lot of importance on that putt. You've got to break it down, take all that psychological blubber out of the way and say, this is a putt. You know, it's a physical putt. It's three foot putt. Step in, hit it solid and let's live with the results. You know, and I, I, I got to tell you, you know, kind of a funny story on myself. I was talking about this, how and Chase at a uh, golf writers meeting. And I was, you know, a, a, one of the key speakers and Chi Chi Rodriguez was right behind me. And someone asked me the same question. Would you putt any differently on a $5 putt, a $50 putt or a putt for $500,000? And I said, no, I mean, a putt is a putt is a putt. And I will actually throw a little aspersions to myself. Chi Chi got up there and he said, Dr. Bob, he goes, I love everything you said. I really do. I know. And it's unbelievable. I, I wish I had you when I was playing. He goes, but I can tell you one thing for sure. You've never putted the putt for $500,000, you know, and it got everybody laughing. And then he goes, but I understand the premise. He goes, but it's, it's like you say, you know, it's easier to talk the talk than it is to walk the walk, but you got to start someplace. And the sooner you get started thinking like this, the better your golf game becomes. I think you're probably right. It's all been great stuff. Uh, thanks for being on Be The Right Club today. Uh, I'm sure all of our listeners uh, got something out of today's podcast. So, well, Thank you, Hal. Thank you, Chase. It's really been an honor to be with you. And uh, if this helps, you know, quite a few people, you know, then Godspeed, you know. And everybody, remember, the moment you change your mind, you change your game. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Doc, a lot of really good practical stuff. Um, where can our guests find more information about you? They can find me on Instagram at Dr. Robert Winters and Dr. Bob Winters. They can also go to my website, theconfidencedoctor.com. And they can also go to davidledbetter.com. And I'm there. You know, they can find me. And if you can't find me those places, just Google my name, Dr. Bob Winters. I will show up someplace, okay? Go, go find a Florida phone book somewhere. <laughs> they'll, they'll find me for sure. Thanks, fellas. Awesome, Doc. Thanks. It. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being on. Yeah, thank you. Be the right club today. Yes!